Hi, Andy Peters, operating partner for uh, the Georgia Legacy Group. Welcome to another edition of GLG Leaders. And um, these are just such a joy for me. This has been Team Leader Week. Uh, this is our grand finale. Uh, we had a great, great session with Laura Donna uh, Get from Kelvin's North Atlanta on Tuesday. Yesterday was uh, Mike Mulder. He made us all cry, which was great. And uh, we're, we're ending the, the week with Mr. Aubrey Bailey. How you doing, man? Doing great. So is that how we know if we have a great session, if somebody cries on it? <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Is that the goal? Andy? Andy? <laughs> you may make me cry. cry. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's when we know it's a good one. All right. So we got people popping in and they're saying that they're here. So that's always good. So let's get down to it, man. Um, you are... You you always have fun. I mean, you always have a smile on your face. You have the best attitude about everything. Where does that come from? <laughs> That's a great question. You know, there was a quote that stuck with me that I heard a long time ago, and it's, uh, you know, life is 10% what happens and 90% how we choose to react to it. And, you know, every day somebody will ask me, you know, how am I doing? And my answer is always going to be the same. You know, I am absolutely amazing. Why? Because I woke up this morning. You know, I'm here, I'm breathing, and I have the opportunity and the ability to control what happens next, you know? And and I love that. Like, we're so lucky to be here. If if someone took away everything we had right now, our house, our car, our family, any money we have in the account, if they took away everything we had today and they gave it back to us tomorrow, tomorrow would be the best day of our life, right? So it's like, we always have something to be thankful for, and that's why I'm always smiling, because I'm happy to be here. That's great, man. Well, and you've got some great stories of overcoming adversity yourself. We'll we'll get into to all that. Tell us about you. Like, how did you find your way into you know? Tell us about growing up, and then how you found your way into real estate. Yeah, so uh, grew up really in Alpharetta, Georgia. You know, I was, I was born in Texas, moved here when I was five, so to Dunwoody first, and then Alpharetta in. Uh, 89. So I've been, you know, in that area since 1989. Went away to college at um, Southern Polytechnic State University, studying engineering for three years, and um, realized I didn't want to be an engineer. <laughs> so uh, didn't want to be stuck behind a desk on a computer in a cubicle. You know, I, I, I wanted to talk with people. You know, be in front of people and help people and make an impact in people's lives. So transferred to um, KSU, Kennesaw State University, and uh, graduated uh, from there with a degree in business management. And Mr. Uh, you asked, you know, how did we get into real estate? How did this happen? Uh, the one and only Mr. Robert Doyle has been a longtime family friend. And for those of you that don't know, Robert is an absolutely amazing guitarist and a wonderful singer as well. And, uh, and he was in a band uh, with my dad, my father. So, I mean, since I was five years old, I used to sit in rooms behind the drummer um, uh, when they were practicing and playing. And, and so I kind of grew up, uh, as a, as a musician. Um, and Robert said, you know, Aubrey, I think you'd be really good at real estate. You should give it a shot. And I was like, I'll give it a year, hundred percent, hundred percent for a year. And here we are, this is my 16th year, uh, in the business, you know, so 16 years later and loving every minute of it. Wow. That's awesome. Well, you're, you're a musician yourself, right? Drummer. Yeah, I'm a drummer. <laughs> so that's, that's um, a joke in the, in the musical world, if, whether or not drummers are musicians. <laughs> no, that's the hard Bass players and drummers, man, those are just impossible to find. Everybody wants to be a guitar player. Yeah. yeah. Everybody wants to be a singer, right? Yeah. Drumming's fun, man. Love it. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So what did that look like for you? Were you in the band or did you do, how did you develop a, 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 your drumming and your musicianship? Well, all you started back, you know, sitting in the same room as Robert Doyle and um, and sitting behind the drummer. And then I'd, I'd pop on the drums afterwards and tinker around. And uh, that guy's name was Wynn, Wynn Smalley. And he'd, he'd show me how to play and uh, ended up getting my first drum set. My first job, I, I got paid four dollars and twenty five cents an hour and I, at Winn-Dixie as a bagger. And I, I saved up uh, twelve hundred dollars to buy a, a, a drum set, a Pearl Export drum set. Um, and then started getting in bands, you know, all through, I mean, middle school, high school, I was in bands and uh, through college, I was in a couple cover bands. We, at one point we played out four nights a week, four nights a week, every single wow. night we were playing out almost, um, got into original band after that. And, um, 
now not not playing drums as much as I used to, but I help my kids play. I mean, lately here, I'm, I'm kind of looking at, uh, across the way. We've got a little electronic drum set set up and they come down and we we jam out. We have fun. So did you have the real long hair like you just pulled it back in a ponytail? Is that the way? Is that the way? <laughs> <laughs> I've never had this conversation with you before, Andy. This is fun. Um, yeah, I had they people used to say I looked like the Nelson boys. Remember the Nelson boys? <laughs> When I had hair, it was like just really fine, and really straight and blonde. And uh, yeah, I did. Uh, at one point I was in a heavy metal band and I, I had a dare. I was I was working as a um, a bus boy at um, at Buffalo's Cafe. And uh, there was this lady in the bar. She's like, I'll, I dare you to shave half your head. I'm like, I'm not going to shave half my head. She's like, I'll pay you. And I was like, how much? Was $35. <laughs> you know, at the time I'm like, 15. I'm like 35 bucks. I'm in. It'll grow back. Absolutely. <laughs> I, had, I had half my head shaved and half of it long. And I was in like a, a metal band for a little while there. That'd be a good look for you. I bet you could recruit a lot more people if you did that. Yeah, right. <laughs> Real good look. Yeah, I bet Gary would put you on stage if you do that. He'd love that. I'm sure. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so talk to us about your why. What What is that? What does that mean to you? And, and what, what keeps you going? Uh, my why is setting a wonderful example for my kids on who they can become and what their life should look like. And there's there's more to that. Um, you know, I grew up in a household where my parents fought all the time. And they ultimately, uh, and I remember it vividly, the, the the intense arguments they got in. And it was usually around money. You know, they were usually fighting over money. And um, ultimately, it led to divorce. And I, I lost my dad to an addiction. Um, you know, he passed away on Father's Day. And myself and my brother and sister are the ones who found him. And um, I was like, I never want my kids to grow up in a household like that. You know, mm. I, I want them to see a strong, healthy relationship that's built on love and care and set an example on giving into others and pouring into others. And so that's what I, I live my, my life through is, is helping other people and setting an example for my kids. Love that. And I've heard that story before. It's very touching. So how do you um, I guess how do you prevent fights around money? Because I think a lot of people do. I mean, money is like a big issue for a lot of people. Most most people have some sort of an issue with money, right? How do you, um, I, I guess for, from you and Sarah, how do you guys not have a fight about money? Like how do you dance around that or how do you redirect that? What do you do? You know, I found, and that's a good question. I've never been asked that. A, a lot of people that I saw, especially growing up, they would have fights when it was too late to fix it, you know? Like mm -hmm. they, they weren't taking steps to, to fix whatever could happen. So a lot of it with Sarah's openly talking about where we're at and looking at things and what's coming in the future and how to prepare uh, and, and what do we want things to look like? And, you know, each decision we're making, is that putting us further on that path? So when we have a clear vision of, of what we want, the decisions become easy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, is this something that you do? use vision boards? How do you, how do you remind yourself of, of why you do what you do? If I wouldn't, I, so I'm usually on my phone, I'm on my, my laptop right now. I, I like, it's all hooked up to the external monitors. So I turned around, I've got a vision board right now, you know, with uh, the, dip, the house that we have, you know, uh, that we're going to get um, in the Caribbean. I've got a, a picture of a couple car washes and me standing in front of them. I've got a, a, a picture of me sitting in a 911 turbo that I bought with cash, which hasn't happened yet, but I will. I'm saying it past tense, like it's already happened. Yeah. It's going to happen. <laughs> so all that. Love it. Love it. So um, how did you, how did you build your production team? Cause I mean, you're, you were a single agent, you built a team and, and now you've moved into leadership in the market centers, but the team is still going. So, Walk me through how did you build your team and then ultimately why did you make the decision to step out of that business in some capacity to take on new opportunity? Yeah, good question. So um, like a lot of people, I think yourself included, a lot of it grew entrepreneurially, um, you know, just through working my tail off and pouring into others. I never worried about a commission check. It was always about what's the right thing to do. How can I help this person? And it naturally grew. So, you know, back I got in in 05. Um, kind of like, kind of like you seem like a good year, those years to get into real estate. And, uh, I actually got busier every year, you know, every single year. And I hit this natural ceiling by myself in 2010. It was about give or take 50 transactions a year. 
And I was stuck there from like 09, 2010, 2011, you know, hovering around like your 50, 55 transactions a year as an individual referral based. And that's about all I can handle. That's a lot. I mean, working a lot of hours, you know, uh, just me. And, uh, and then I got reintroduced to MREA. It was given to me up front. I never digested it. I read it, you know, but just didn't digest it. Was reintroduced. I think I went to a family reunion, um, which can be a turning point in people's career. And uh, came back, hired a part-time admin. Uh, shortly thereafter, I had a, she went to full-time, had a um, agent come to me. She was at another company for two years, had sold two houses and um, said, I'd love for you to take me under your wing and show me the ropes. And I was like, I need the help. So I literally handed her 42 transactions. I think two or three of them were hers and the rest of them were just referrals, like my people, you know. Um, fast forward a few years, you know, so that got us up to like 80 or 90 transactions a year, uh, over 20 million in volume. And fast forward a few years, um, hired a few more people. Um, and I really, you know, anybody that's on here, have you ever walked through a house you know, and, and you're like, holy cow, this is such a good deal. Yeah. It needs a little paint and carpet, but man, you fix this up. You're sitting on so much equity and like the buyer's just like, I don't see it. You know, I don't see it. I just don't want it. Well, I happened, a, you know, a good bit. And eventually I was like, you know what, if they don't want to buy it, I'll buy it. You know? So I started flipping properties and I'd, I'd always done one or two a year, almost since I started. And in 2012 or 13, um, the team was at a point where it, it was almost running on its own. So I decided to, to really focus heavily on flipping properties. It's, it's great. It's easy to get a price reduction or do the upgrades that need to be done when you're having that conversation with yourself. <laughs> you know, there's no convincing. It's, it's, it's a lot easier. So um, I flipped 43 homes in about three wow. years, you know, between 2013 and 2016. And um, team was still running referral based. And the office came to me, uh, Melba Franklin at the time came to me two or three times and was asking me to step into the team leader role. And I was like, no, no I'm having fun flipping houses. And, um, you know, I sat down with um, Harry and he, he made an arrangement with me, which I know we're probably going to talk about for some opportunities for um, part ownership in the office. And remember, if you go back to that big why you asked me, it was about, you know, not ever having arguments about money with my wife and having financial security and setting an example for what a good relationship looks like, you know, for my kids. And so having that opportunity of creating some passive income where where eventually the passive income exceeds what we need to live each month, which is the ultimate goal, was extremely appealing to me. So I, I sat down and said, well, what does that look like? How do we create a win? And um, that's how I kind of stepped into this role. Love it. So, um, I mean, flipping 40 plus houses, what what'd you learn from that? <clears throat> um, I got really, really good at analyzing numbers and, and estimating what a property would ultimately sell for because it was my money on the line, right? Uh, if, if, I, if I messed up and I put, I mean, it's, a direct, it's not somebody else's, it's my own, it's hurting my family. So I got really good at being able to identify one, what upgrades make sense two, what it will be worth once it's ultimately fixed up. How that helps is when you're having conversations with clients, with sellers, is you can give them three prices. I used to do that. You know, here's because during that time I was flipping, I still helped some families buying and selling homes, uh, but I was mostly flipping. And I would say, here's three prices. Here's what it is right now, the way it sits right now. Here's what it is if we did these upgrades, this small upgrades, and here's what it approximately what it would bring if we went, you know, and all out. Not only that, here's what it would cost to do each of those, and here's what our our net would be. People love that, you know, being able to analyze that. And you had to be specific. I mean, that was a down market when we were doing that. You better be right on your numbers. You can't just let the market. Oh, the market will fix it. A couple more months, values will go up. Like, no, you got to be on it. You know, you have to understand. Um, I learned the importance of pre appraisals you know, uh, pre-listing appraisals. And um, I learned the importance of getting data to appraisers before they arrive at the property to prevent the low appraisal before it happens. Um, in a down market where banks were, you know, uh, falling apart left and right, I learned the importance of putting a condition in the contract before we went binding that uh, that they would talk to my lender to get pre-qualified. I wouldn't accept their offer until they talked. They didn't have to use my lender but I require that they talk to my lender. I, if they didn't want to, they don't, I'm just, I won't go under contract with them. You know, yep. they use whoever they want, but I want them to talk to my lender. And what I found was that prevented a lot of deals from falling apart. Yeah. They, you're proofing. Yeah. Yeah. 
So that's some of the stuff I learned uh, doing that. Yeah. I mean, I, I never flipped anywhere near that many houses, um, you know, and I'm guessing that probably some of those flips were more successful than others. Right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, there were some learning moments on a few of them. Um, yeah. I, I can gladly say uh, almost every single one, but two out of the 43, all but two of them were uh, were profitable. So yeah. definitely some learning moments on on those two that that, that were not. Well, yeah, that's how we learn the most, for sure. Um, so you came out of nowhere as like you're this rookie team leader that kind of took the region by storm. Um, you know, back to back years, 100 plus net. Like, I mean, you took that market center when you came in, what, 2016? There was 130 agents there. Yeah, in October. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And when you stepped out of that role, there was what, about 425? Right. Yeah. Um, how'd you do that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great question. Um, we, we brought on, we analyzed it. And uh, just like my, my business in, in sales uh, with the production team, it was almost all referrals and it was just pouring into other people. And, and it's almost magnetic. Like when you, when you do such a good job for people, they almost feel guilty not telling other people about you. Success becomes easy. Yeah. Yeah. You attract. Yeah. Um, yeah. They, we talked about that a little bit in um, Curve Visioning, it, the power of your magnet, right? Your, your value that you bring makes the magnet stronger. And you've always been somebody that's you know provided massive value to others. Um, how, um, I guess from a, a market center dynamic standpoint, how did the market center change from going from 130 agents to 425 during your three year tenure there? Yeah. So I was in that market center. I mean, that was the first, that was my home. You know, I started there in 2005. I lived in Kennesaw and Woodstock and I would drive across town to be at that market center. So you know, stepping into that role, I was like, well, it, what's the one thing I can do such that people from across the town will want to drive past five other offices, KW or not, to come to this one, right? What would I have to do to make this that kind of office? And it was, you know, create an environment where everybody gives back to everybody, you know, kind of like we're seeing here with the group, you know, top producers sharing all their little secrets, everything they're doing where we can all be better together. We can make it through this together. And we're gonna be stronger because of it, right? So as the, the market center grew, the biggest challenge was keeping that, that culture alive, you know, of sharing and caring. And that's why, you know, we put in, in place small groups. And the biggest challenge I would say, Andy, by far, is somebody slipping through the cracks. What yeah. happened to Jane Doe? We haven't seen her, you know? She didn't mm. ever plug in. And usually yep. the people that left were not the ones that were there. It was the ones that didn't plug in that we just we didn't see them, you know. So uh, that's the challenge growing is making sure that the people that that we have the opportunity to get in business with are loved on and cared on and, and feel warm and welcome and invited and want to be there, you know. Yeah, well, and that's certainly um, been the challenge during all this, right, is that it's a lot easier for people to hide and not that I mean, people that that don't want to come in. Like we don't, we don't want you to feel pressure about that. We want you to get what you, what you want. Right. Um, but yeah, this has been a challenge on the staff uh, for, for all the offices is to, you know, really going through and caring for all of our people when we don't see them every day. Um, and yeah, it's made us create new systems. Um, and I think in the end we'll be a lot better for it. I agree. That keeps me up at night, Andy. It's like, who are the agents that are not plugged in right now? Mm. Agents that are not plugged in right now are, are going to be the ones that are not in the business six months, eight months, a year from now. So the ones that are they're tuned in here, the ones that are making on 11 o'clock calls and, you know, uh, education without implementation is just entertainment. So make sure you're actually putting stuff in place that you learn. And yet those ones on the call that are learning and getting those great ideas and actually taking action, they're going to be in this business and they're going to make it through. The ones that are not, they won't be here. You know, and it really scares me when agents, you know, and I, I, I fear for agents that are at companies where they don't have this. How are they going to make it through? 
They don't have people pouring into them every day. You know, your environment determines your success. Boy, isn't that true? We've seen that play out. Um, Yeah. So what does, um, what does KW North Atlanta, what, what does that mean to you? So um, I love that question. You know, like I mentioned, that was my 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 home, my baby. Like I've since 05, you know, that's, you know, 16 years. So it was uh, it's a place that has a big part of my heart, like my my first love. Right. <laughs> you know, and, um, you know, I, I still, of course, have a very vested interest in what happens there. And I have so many, Andy, wonderful memories tied, you know, to that office. So many wonderful things that have happened. Uh, for so many years, so many relationships that were uh, that were developed that I still have and people I still talk with on a very frequent basis. Uh, so it's a very warm spot in my heart. That's what that's what KW North Atlanta means to me. Yeah. Well, and then we kind of shift into this uh, this new phase. I want to talk about this new um, career you're starting in another market center. Um, but before we get there, why don't we talk about Southeast Alabama? Um, oh, yeah. Because that's a that's a pretty cool story and um, certainly an opportunity that I, I want our people to hear uh, that this this is such a company of opportunity. So how did all of that go down? So um, this was I remember we were on the kids, Sarah and I and the kids were on the beach uh, in um, it was it was October uh, about, I guess, a year and a half ago. And um, I got a call from Brett Caldwell and Cheryl Sadoti, and they said that they had been having some discussions. They were really um, appreciative over everything we had done at North Atlanta. And and guys, I hope you hear this. No one succeeds alone. Like what happened in that office was not because of me. It was because of a team of, of people who all shared the same vision, the same goal, um, you know, providing an excellent environment for the agents there that became magnetic and it grew. And they said, hey, we've been we've been intending on opening an office uh, you know, we want to talk with you about that opportunity. We're really excited about what you did in North Atlanta. We'd love for you to take this to a little town called Dothan. I was like, where's Dothan? (laughs) They said, they said, well, have you ever been to Panama City or 30A or any of those areas? I was like, oh, yeah, of course. You know, in fact, I'm there now. (laughs) You know, I think we were in Destin at the time. And uh, she said, well, there's this, uh, when you go through, there's this little area, a, a road called Ross Clark Circle. You know, it's like, it's like 285, you know, but way smaller, you know? And I was like, yeah, Ross Clark Circle. I know Ross Clark Circle. She said, that's Dothan. I said, oh, okay. Yeah. So um, it's just a little town. Um, you know, it, it's uh, the total agent count there and, you know, non-broker owners is about 425, about the same size that North Atlanta is, you know? And she's like, they don't have KW there and the environment there, like the way those brokerages treat their their agents, uh, the you know, the, the, the way the training that's available there is not the same as it could be. And they really need KW in Dothan. You know, are you willing to do it? I was like, that's like three and a half, four hours away. <laughs> what does that look like? How often would you have to go down? You know, and she said, you go down once a week and spend the whole day there. You know, there'll be phone calls in between. I'm confident you could get that office open and they had been trying to get something going for a little while and weren't able to get much traction. And so I went down there, got, got the right people engaged and uh, we launched the office um, opened in April of last year and had its first transmittal profitable transmittal in, uh, in July. So uh, that was the first transmittal you do is, you know, 90 days later. So it was great. It's been been fun. You know, and and to put that in perspective in Atlanta, we have, 20 plus KW offices in Metro Atlanta. Um, so the the chance to take KW to an area that's never been touched by KW is really, really exciting. I mean, it's really cool. Um, and you can already see, I mean, I know you've got 40, 50 agents down there now, um, but you can already see the spark um, and, and, and the light and the light's getting bigger, but you can already see what, what kind of a difference that's going to make in their local board, um, you know, the level of professionalism, it's we're just going to raise the bar. So that's, that's really awesome. And now you're not going down there once a week, are you? No, mm-mm. doing a lot. Of, I'm telling you good, good can come out of this. And part of that's we're learning how to leverage technology. Yeah. Yeah, no doubt. 
Um, so now let's talk about another conversation you and I had um, one day. You called me and you said something was keeping you up. Um, and I'd love for you to share that conversation because that took us down a, another another kind of interesting path. So yeah. what was keeping you up? Yeah, so um, two words that I think all of us should be able to relate to are, are passion and purpose. And I woke up in the middle of the night. You know, this was, a, you know, a little while, not that long ago, really, a few months back. And about and, and it, what was on my mind is what's my passion? What's my purpose? You know, and what I found is I love building things. I love building things. I love taking something that maybe, you know, could, has so much potential and hadn't hit that yet. Like North Atlanta, for example, is a great example. Um, you know, it was, it was like um, that office. Everybody was wondering, why hadn't it done well? You know, why hadn't it taken off yet? It's a great location, great price point, great area. Why hadn't it taken off? And it was just nowhere on the charts inside KW or, or the area. So, um, you know, I stepped in that role and with the right people, you know, that office is is, is killing it, top in the whole country, you know, top 10 consistently. So, um, you know, I love doing it. It was a fun, it was like a rocket ship, you know, it's exciting to get in there every day and help build something. Um, same thing, you know, I've had other, uh, in previous jobs, you know, I was a, a lot manager for a valet parking company and they used to send me to different lots that were having trouble and the relationships weren't good with the restaurants and they want me to go in and fix what was going on. So I go there and fix it and go to another one, go to, and that was my, my MO, you know, is going there and fix it. So I found that middle in the middle of the night, I just hadn't been feeling as fulfilled as I had in the past. And I woke up with passion and purpose. I'm like, Aubrey, this is this is your passion. This is what your purpose is, is building things and making things the best they can possibly be and taking it to what it's truly capable of. Whether that's people or an organization is just pouring in and, and, and making things as good as they can be. So I called you and we talked about you know, different opportunities. And you mentioned that there might potentially be one, you know, at Roswell. And I said, well, let's talk about it. And, you know, a month or so later, here we are, you know, two months later, here we are. Well, and I know North Atlanta was obviously sad to lose you. It, it helps when you got somebody like Laura Donna that can step in and, and, you know, she doesn't fill your shoes. She did a great analogy on that. And you don't want to wear red pumps like her, <laughs> but, um, but Roswell, you know, rejoiced as well. I mean, uh, to get somebody like Bill Linkwald to move into productivity coaching, to get you to move into team leader position, that just instantly raised the profile for for that office. So, what what what's your plans for Roswell? Like, what do you you know what would you come there for? So, uh, the thing with Roswell, that office has been in the past. A top office in the in the company, right? You're in the top 100 in the company, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly. In the top 100 out of 800, so they're all yeah. excellent offices. Yeah, and um, being able to go there and say, "All right, I I would love for us to be top of the charts again." What does that look like? And it's not necessarily about exponential growth. It's about getting in business with the right people. And what would it look like if if the productivity in, in this Roswell office is higher per agent than any other office in the company? Right. What would that look like if that that if Roswell is known for being you want to get into production and want to get in production fast? That's where you go. Right. You get you get the help you need and you are almost guaranteed success to be at that office. Well, when you pour into everybody there and productivity is going through the roof per agent. Right. They're living a great life. When they live a great life and they're loving what they do and the culture is where it should be, they want to tell everybody else about it. Well, when they tell everybody else about it, then it grows. You know, I've shared this story before. We don't bring on everybody. There's agents that, that we turn down consistently. I mean, I've turned down agents with over 100 listings personally said no. Why? Because they weren't a good fit culturally. And that was that's a hard decision being in this role saying no to everybody. Yet I know it's the right decision because culture is everything. And it's so important to protect that. Oh, so true. Um, and I think we're seeing the the fruits of that culture, those culture decisions that we've made. We're seeing the fruits of that right now. I mean, you know, I, I think um, um, uh, what's his name, John Maxwell. He said, you know, when you get squeezed, what comes out of you? And I think we're being squeezed right now. And there's some pretty awesome stuff that's coming out, right? I mean. I'm really, really proud of the job that you and 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 Mike and Lord Anna and Robert and Sam, like you guys are crushing it right now. 
Um, and I think that's a that's a testament to your belief and, and a testament to who you are. And when the going gets tough, the, the tough get going. Um, testament to you, too, Andy. Leadership starts at the top. So thank you. Dude, I'm walking with you. We're, we're, we're locked arms side by side right now. Um, so talk to me about what the KW opportunity has meant to you personally and professionally. Yeah. So, um, you know, before being in the team leader role, I'd never really focused on uh, profit share. And what a missed opportunity. I did have, don't get me wrong, I didn't have a downline. I was, you know, getting a decent bit of uh, profit share. And um, it's created different opportunities and, and growth patterns. If anybody wants to see something, shoot me an email and uh, I'll give you, um, there's a chart that actually shows all the different opportunities that are inside KW. And it's, it's a phenomenal thing to look at where you can kind of decide where you want to go. So, I mean, right now, you know, I've got uh, ownership in multiple offices. Um, I've got the production team that's, that's still running out of North Atlanta. Um, that's almost, it's referral based, you know, it's just, you know, my friends and family and sending them there. And, and those girls on that team are working their tails off with their, their database as well. And, um, there's opportunities for, for profit share, for coaching. Um, there's so many different ways to really, you can get KWU certified, be a trainer. Uh, there's so many opportunities in this company to go down your path and it's exciting to kind of explore each of those and see which one, you know, uh, wakes you up pumped up and excited each morning. So I'm, I'm loving the journey that that's in front of us and the opportunities that we all have. Well, I want to talk about profit share for a second, because I mean, I think we've all become kind of uh, deaf to this, like it kind of people start talking about profit share within our company. And, and I just feel this collected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, I, I don't think people really, really get it. Why do you think so many agents don't take advantage of it? It's a good question. Uh, probably for the same reason that I didn't. You know, I, I, in my own mind, right, it was I didn't want to seem pushy about joining KW. I just want to focus on families. It wasn't really brought to my attention very often about, you know, profit share and the opportunity. It didn't seem like real money until I got the, the first, you know, few checks. And I was like, this is adult money, you know. Uh, and it's something you don't have to work. Like, think about it this way. So uh, rental properties, right? I have rental properties, bought and sold rental properties. That's the one regret I have of flipping all those homes. I wish I would have kept more. I was picking one regret. But it's like, we'll, we'll put down fifty, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000 on a rental property to give us 300, 400, 500 bucks a month, right? And if anything goes wrong with it, we've got to pay to fix the toilet and fix the roof. And, you know, we got costs with it. And I'm not saying don't get rentals, do in fact get a whole lot of them. Okay. And, you know, look at profit share. Cost you zero, you know, you have zero risk and you, yeah. you can get that much profit share easily. It's like one, you can't guarantee numbers, but I mean, one agent I've seen easily do two to, on your downline, two to three thousand dollars a year in profit share, you know, in many scenarios. So, and that costs you nothing. What if you had 10, just 10, right? 10 people. It's, that could be, if they're cappers, it could be potentially twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year. That's, two, three thousand dollars a month. How much is your mortgage? Well, now profit share just paid for your mortgage. You've got zero risk. You know, what if you took all of that money? This is like Linda McKissick, right? What if you took all that money and put it into a separate account? That's what I do. It goes into a separate account. I have a separate account. All the money goes into that account. What's that account for? For buying rental properties, right? So essentially profit sharing is funding buying my long-term retirement. Yeah. Wealth building. Yeah. Yeah. So um, we just about a week ago, we made the decision, um, all of us, all, all of the leadership group and directors, we made the decision to open up that 11 o'clock call to anybody from uh, additional companies. We don't we're not trying to get into some competition with other KW offices, although I know there's some KW um, from KW people from other offices that are coming to our classes. And that's great. I, I hope it brings value to them. But we've got a pretty awesome opportunity to um, to help out the other brokers, right? To help out the other brands, and and in the process of that, I do think we we get an opportunity to show one of our you know put our best foot forward and show one of our best features, right? Which is our training. Um, how what kind of a script or how how can agents have conversations uh, to invite people to 
this type of training or you know anything that's going on right now? What, what advice would you give to to agents that are talking to other agents from other companies right now? Yeah, you know, one thing that Michael Mayer didn't say this morning that's that's in his books is he said, uh, don't uh, he said communicate with, don't market to. Like, don't market to your people, communicate with them. And there's there's agents and people you've run into that that is every other company having daily Zoom calls with top professionals showing them exactly how to walk through every step of this? No, they're not. I know they're not because I'm talking with the other agents who are coming into these Zoom calls and saying, holy cow, I can't believe all this is being provided. You know, so they need you right now. And, the, and think about think about the families behind them, behind these agents. You know, I almost feel like I, I'm letting them down and all of us should feel the same way by not inviting them to something. Don't market to don't say, you know, hey, want to make six figures your first year? Come to this. Sign up here. Right. Instead, say, hey, there's we're getting these daily calls with some awesome information. Tomorrow there's going to be a call with, you know, Michael Mayer. Right. He wrote the seven levels of communication. He's going to be showing us how we can really help people in our world right now, you know, and, and we're getting tips on how to guide us through. Come hop in. Nothing about joining KW. Just join the call. And, and I trust that you hopping on that call is going to give you some information to help you and your family. You know, I've, I've never like those people that we've added, you know, in North Atlanta and now starting at Roswell, it's, it's been referral based. You know, it's been the agents are passionate, like the ones on this on this call now, the, the, the Facebook Live now. They're passionate about where they're at and they want other people to experience it. Just invite people to come experience what you are. You don't have to mention joining KW. Just say, come get some ideas to help you in your business. I want to see you make it through this and come out on the other side better than you are right now. Come hop on this call and learn a few things. Yeah, I love that. And, and the follow-up to that is for you to reach out to them afterwards and ask them what were their ahas. Yeah, follow-up's everything. Nothing will happen if you don't follow up, right? Um, after you follow, yeah, ask them what their ahas were and, and ask them what they need in their business right now. And then as we're having stuff that relates directly to that, invite them to that. Like right now, anybody that's listening right now, we have Bold going on about to start, right? Um, and there's free maps coaching for agents who are not with KW for 30 days, for 30 days. Agents that are with KW can actually get, I believe, two months free right now if they sign up for maps. But external agents right now, if they're cappers, can get 30 days free maps coaching right now. You know, we can give that to them, though. Maps is allowing us to do that. When you get them ingrained in our culture, you know, you invite them to bold. And by the way, the office will talk to your team leader. Uh, will most likely pay if you have a good, you know, recruit. They'll we'll pay for them to go through bold, no strings attached. So let's say you know an agent who's not with KW, and you're worried that they may have a little trouble right now. They're struggling. Say, you know, if I'm not sure if I can, but if I was able to get you, you know, a ticket to get into bold or get into maps coaching for a month, you know, and this is where. The average agent in bold does seven transactions generated from that short period. Is that something you'd be interested in? If I can get that for you, you know, would you be interested in taking that course? No strings attached. You, just, you can just have it. Most right. people are like, yeah, of course. We can do that. Give that to them. What ultimately happens is the people that, that get into that training, you know, they see something they've never gotten at their own company and end up wanting to know more about KW. So it's like it almost happens naturally. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah, it's amazing to see um, the way KW has stepped up with this. I mean, to create an online bold experience and then to make it only a hundred dollars. I think they they I don't think that they did that with the intention that the market centers would pick it up for everybody, but they made it low enough that the market centers can consider that, right? And you know, Georgia Legacy Group, we it was a no brainer. I mean, we. We we're going to reimburse people uh, that graduate from Bold for that hundred dollars, uh, and we're thrilled to do it. I mean, that's just a, making an investment in in our people. And I I set out a goal. This is funny. I, I called you guys. Was it day before yesterday? We do an eight o'clock huddle with all the team leaders and and um, the directors. And um, I was like, all right, I think we can get two hundred people in in Bold. And what did you guys do? What'd you say? I think you said maybe no Molder was like 300, forget 200, 300. We get 300 in bold. And then we were like, well, a lot of those people are probably no other agents that they want to invite. And he's like, let's make it, let's put four, let's make it five. We're going to get 500 people in bold combined between our, our, our offices and any external people that really need it right now. So bold changed my life. 
It really did. I drove to, to Tennessee to take bold. I was driving three and a half, four hours to take bold once a week. And that was one of those turning points in my career. One of the best years I ever had was directly because of bold. So man, to be able to sit at home, bold 2.0, you know, I wasn't a big, you know, cold call, door knock, expired person. I never have been. Now they've totally retooled it uh, to be a lot of referral based, you know, connection based um, uh, classes and training is phenomenal. And you do it from home and it's it's a hundred bucks. No, wait, it's free because the office is going to reimburse you. Like that's a no brainer. All thousand plus agents should be signed up for bold. All of them because it ends up being free. Yeah, I agree. And it's you'll have the best of the best from uh, bold bold coaches that will be on that. So we're, we're looking forward to that. Um, so what do you, what advice do you have for the agent right now? That's maybe a little scared because there, there's a lot of that, right? I mean, I, I've said this publicly, I, I'm on these calls literally all day long with market center after market center, region after region. Uh, and I'm attending as much training as I'm, I'm doing. And, um, I get off, I really get done with my day, you know, five, six o'clock and I am so fired up and then I'll turn on the TV and start watching that garbage can and, you know, 30 minutes of it just wrecks you. Um, so I understand like somebody that's not right plugged in the way you and I are plugged in and maybe they're watching the garbage can literally all day long. Like it could be really, really bad for them. What do you say to the, the agent that's a little scared about what's going on and um, uneasy? Yeah, there was a um, we can't discount what's happening right now. Like, like there there is some big stuff happening right now. And, I, you know, think of this is not 2008 it's, it's different, you know, and yet we are going to see a hit. And Mark Twain had a really good quote that I can relate a lot with. He said, I've had many worries in my life, most of which never happened. Now, what that means in this scenario is we can worry ourselves sick about what might possibly could potentially maybe happen, right? However, we can't control what might happen. All we can control is what we can do every day. What is our part of it? What can we control every single day? You know, Gary talks about find the motivated. You know, what, what we did before, a lot of the people that didn't have to move, they're not going to move right now. You know, and even some of the people that want to move may not qualify anymore. Mortgages are changing. People are losing jobs. So it's going to take us being in communication with more people and finding more motivated people. We can control. We can control how many people we're in contact with. And it doesn't have to be a, hey, who do you know looking to buy, sell or invest in real estate? Never did that. I never will. Right. Uh, if I was back in sales production, I still wouldn't be calling saying that. Right. There's so many warm ways that we can build this business. We need, to, we need to be focused on what we can control, not the worst case scenario, what could possibly happen, but what can we do right now to, to ensure our success? So if you think about this, Andy, if this isn't 2008, right? And, and yet in the great recession of 2008, there were agents who absolutely smashed it and had the best years of their life, right? Then that means we could have years of growth. Well, what do we need to do to have those years of growth? And let's get out there and do it. Let's not focus on what might happen. Let's focus on what we can control right now in this moment. Love that. Thanks for sharing that. So um, what's next for you? You keep, you keep moving through stuff. Like what's next for you? Uh, great question, Andy. I mean, right now my 100% focus is on, on pouring into the agents in Roswell, you know, helping them grow. You know, I'm doing, uh, you know, one-on-one -on -one Zoom meetings with agents. I was doing a lot. You know, when we were when we were open and able to, um, you know, see each other face to face, well, I'm pouring into them. So keep pouring into them, keep growing this office, growing meaning um, add add programs that help them be the most productive agents per agent out of the whole MLS. Um, it's creating that magnetic environment, and once it gets to a point where it's rocking and rolling, and it's doing really well. Who knows? You know, I, I know you and I have talked before about, you know, if if you end up opening other offices in the area, maybe I what well, yeah. that. When, yeah, when, when you do talk to me about it and if the timing's right, great. It, it, but I'm, I'm not thinking about the next step yet. I'm focusing hundred percent on Roswell and how I can show up and be there for, for everybody there and, and truly make it. What is, if they're looking at what that office could be, what would be a place that would be magnetic for them? Let's make that happen. Yeah. 
Well, you've uh, you've got a big magnet, um, and I, I appreciate you sharing it with us, and I appreciate you know everything that you you've done in such a short period of time on the leadership side. Sure, makes my job a lot easier. Let me just publicly say that. Um, but it's you know it's a pleasure to be in business with you. I I um I know that big things are in store in Roswell just because I've seen you do it. And you like you like to repeat stuff. Um, so it's gonna be fun for everybody to watch, for sure. Oh, team Sport, uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And that I tell you one thing I've gotten from all the agents at Roswell. I'll ask them what's going well here, you know. And then I'll usually also ask, what would you love to see us implement or start doing? And every single one of them has said how absolutely amazing every single one of the staff members are. Like they love, love, love the people there. I keep hearing that over and over and over again. So none of this happens without good people with you, you know. So I'm very grateful for you, grateful for the staff there at Roswell. Grateful for Mike Mulder and Laura Donna and all these other people that are that are really standing up right now and and pouring into other people and uh, it's making all of our lives a lot easier. Yeah, let's just get more people in the eleven o'clock call. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's do that. I think our, our record maybe is around one hundred and forty, one hundred and fifty. Yeah, we hit one sixty or one seventy early on, but yeah, uh, today was around one fifty. We got that. Yeah, yeah. Let's mm -hmm. let's pack that room. Let's pour value like we've never seen it before. And one thing I, you know, I sent a text out to all you guys after the Michael Mayer thing, because as, as Michael was talking, it had me thinking about the mission of, of our group and, and every, everybody is a part of that mission. But, you know, the mission is to, we're a place of stunning excellence that attracts, welcomes and develops real estate leaders with world class value. I mean, that's that's what we set out to do three years ago. Right. I mean, that was. That was why we did the things that we we did then and, and why we do the, the things that we do now. And I'm very, very proud of uh, how everybody's showing up right now because we're, we're living that mission very well. Very well. Great place to be. Loving it. Well, thanks, brother. It's good to see you and uh, stay well. Um, and, you know, I, I love having these conversations. Chances are if all this hadn't happened, we probably wouldn't have gotten an opportunity to hear more of your story. So. Thanks for sharing it with us. Thank you, Andy. And thank you for all the comments. I'm seeing people say some really nice things. I really appreciate that. It doesn't say who you are. It just says Facebook user. <laughs> so whoever you are, thank you very much. I appreciate the kind words. And thank you, Andy, for everything you're doing for us. Oh, man, my pleasure. All right, pal. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. All right. Bye, guys. Bye.